This is The Wheel Weaves, a Wheel of Time podcast with no spoilers. Welcome listeners, this podcast is safe for first time readers because it's made by a first time reader. I'm your host Danny, and I'm the one who's taken on the task of reading through this 15 book mega series. I'm joined by my co-host Brett, who's a longtime fan, and he's acting as my tour guide on this journey. Before we get into our episode today, we want to thank and welcome Matthew Zupka and Josh Sorum to the Wheel Weaves Patreon team. We're really excited to have your support and we really want to thank you for your generous contribution. So this episode, we are going to be talking about chapter 29. Yeah, so we have eyes without pity. Ooh. Yeah, sounds very ominous. It does sound ominous, actually. But turns out only like medium ominous because it's a Perrin chapter <laughs> <laughs> and i know you don't like Perrin that much i'm medium about Perrin, but we get tons of really awesome information this chapter and that's why i really like it yeah i know you like this yeah a lot of it comes in the last couple pages again where we get that like cliffhanger here's some information but we'll dive into it afterwards yeah okay sounds good do you have something to start us off with today yeah so i have a robert jordan fun fact for the day and this one's a little bit about his writing awards. Ooh, okay. Yeah, obviously prominent writer, but I just want to point out a couple of the awards that he won. So this is a short summary, and I'm not going to go into the definitions for each one because they are kind of long and tedious, but he has several wins and many, many, many nominations for different awards. Okay. So he has three nominations for the David Gemmell Legend Award. He's got one nomination and one win for the Pre-Ozone Award. Three nominations for the SF Sight Readers Poll Award, seven nominations for the Locus Awards, one nomination for the World Fantasy Awards, one nomination for the Hugo Award, and the coolest one, I think, is that he won the Phoenix Award, which is for Lifetime Achievement. Oh, cool. In writing? Yeah. Cool. Are they all writing awards, I would assume? Yeah, they're all writing awards and fantasy awards, so there's a variety. He didn't, like, also win an award for, like... (laughs) something crazy like yeah, abstract no, the, art or something he may have i didn't research that I'll, I'll go into that for maybe next episode okay to see if there's any like yeah so that's cool obviously very accomplished to get that lifetime achievement award yeah very well. much so so let's jump into chapter 29 eyes without pity yeah sounds good so we open here with a wolf picture yeah and so i just write down parent chapter yeah makes sense where we left off yeah but so we actually just left off with Nynaeve, lan and moraine leaving whitebridge down the camelin road but perrin and Egwene were heading off to camelin with elias yeah. They had just left the Tinkers after Perrin had a crazy dream where Baalzamon set a wolf on fire and the raven pecked Perrin's left eye. Yes, and we do know now that Maureen, Lan, and Nynaeve changed directions to now go after Perrin and Egwene. Right, so they're actually going north or ish. They're like. They're heading hopefully in the same relative direction because Maureen can sense where Perrin is, but she doesn't know that it is Perrin yeah. or that Egwene is with her. Yeah, I just said they're leaving Whitebridge down the Camelon Road. Yeah. That's all we really have for them. Yeah. They have their sights set on trying to find Perrin, which I think is going to be a disaster. Yeah, possibly. If they ever do <laughs> run into each other with Elias. But that's, you know. Yeah, I'm excited to see what happens if that happens the way you thought it did. <laughs> you always say these funny things like you're excited for but then you change it because you know you can't tell me what you're oh, yeah. excited for i'm excited for events that are going to happen in this book yes yeah me too oh i know <laughs> <laughs> okay so we start out here we actually start out talking about elias and i originally write ooh from his perspective you yeah, nope <laughs> no gotcha got me okay so Elias is pushing them really hard on this journey and being extra careful about everything, like where they camp, making sure the fire is well hidden, and then covering their tracks when they leave the spot where they camped for the night. Egwene is noticing this and is kind of worried and even asks, like, are the Trollocs back? And Elias just says no without any more explanation. Yeah, it seems like he's being more careful than even Lan would be in a typical situation. And no, La- I just think Lan would be better at hiding 
how careful he's being. Okay. I don't think anyone could ever be more careful than Lad. Okay, okay, that's fair. <laughs> like, it's just standing up to them more? Yes. Okay. Yeah, especially from this guy who probably typically doesn't care very much. Yeah. Like, maybe it's just out of character. We do get to see Lan go back and, like, backtrack a lot, so he might be doing some of the things... That's true. Like, out of sight. Yeah. But I just sort of know, like, poor Egwene here... Because she clearly has no idea what's going on at yes, all. Yes, yeah. So Perrin isn't sharing anything with her about the dreams. And she really, really doesn't quite understand like the type of danger she's in. Yeah, it's kind of like a two-sided conversation between Perrin and Elias with the wolves. And Egwene is completely left out of that loop. Yeah. Like we got brought up where Elias said and told Perrin that, hey... You can talk to wolves. Yeah. And Egwene heard that, but there hasn't really been any more discussion about that. No, this has all been in Perrin's head. And we actually get confirmation of that later in this chapter, yeah. which I find pretty interesting. Yeah. But anyway, so Perrin notes that he also knows that Trollocs are nowhere around because the wolves would be able to sense it and he can sense the wolves. Yeah. So I'm relieved here about that because last chapter with Perrin, he had pushed them out of his head. He did. And I didn't know if that was sort of going to be a forever thing. Or just temporary. Yeah, because they sort of say like, oh, even in your dreams and feel kind of... I think the wolves were kind of sad Yeah, that they he was pushing them out. Well, one of the things that the wolves told him was like, you have to commit fully to us yeah. to get the protection, something along those lines. Yeah. So, and he then he immediately shuts them all out. So yeah. that's like hugely concerning. Yeah, but... Turns out he didn't shut them off forever, indefinitely, because the rack, they got back in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's not fear that's driving Elias. It's something else, which he doesn't even understand. Yeah. So it's sort of another sort of gut thing. We keep on hearing this from Elias. It's a reoccurring thought where he doesn't really know how to put words to the things that he's thinking and feeling. Yeah. I think maybe because he's clearly spends so much time not using English to communicate. He's tapped into that like emotional side of things almost. Definitely. Well, yeah. one, of, one of my questions for you was going to be, do you really think that Elias actually doesn't know what why he's feeling what he's feeling? Or is he just like, he knows, but he doesn't want to say it to protect Perrin and Egwene? Maybe. I really do think it's like a gut feeling thing. Okay. Though. I like, do. You, you know what I'm saying? I like think if, it's like a baser instinct type of thing that he's really tapped into okay that's my take on it yeah because he doesn't really seem to be shy about saying things to them yeah the only reason why i was bringing up that counterpoint is like would you really want to tell someone hey there's like you know 50 merdral right behind us because that's just going to make it way worse or something like that like maybe yeah. but he also the way he talks and the way Perrin is saying like hey, are we in danger? Yeah. Like, what are we in danger of? Instead of trying to describe, like, anything, to even try to put Perrin at ease. Yeah. Like, if that was his goal, he could say things to put Perrin at ease. Yeah, yeah. But he doesn't. That's fair. And he just keeps on with this, I don't even understand it either. Yeah, I don't know, but we gotta go. Yeah. But the wolves don't know. Yes. Either. They're just sort of being pushed by the wariness to scout for danger even harder. Yeah, they're like driven by Elias's issues. Yeah, so I guess that Perrin and Elias aren't really having many heart-to-hearts like about this dream. Like where the wolf got Yes, because exploded. I thought that we might get some explanation okay. about this wolf dying in the dream. Yeah, it doesn't seem like they're communicating much with each other. At all, yeah. actually. Because I, as a reader, want them to have some sort of conversation so that I can understand what the heck is going on. Well, it almost seems like Elias should be in that mentor role yeah. with Perrin, but it's clearly not really working out that way that much. No, because I'm still curious about what the heck that dream was all about. Yeah. So that's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, here, the land becomes rolling hills, which becomes very important in this chapter. And Elias avoids going up and over the hills. So they end up making these like wide detours to go around them instead. Yeah, just following the natural contours, it says, of the land. Right. So Perrin notes that he isn't talking much, but when he does, he's being like this crotchety old man. Yeah. 
And to the point where Egwene actually sticks her tongue out at the back of his head at one point. <laughs> Which is pretty funny. That's yeah. like a good reaction. And I just said it's a little silly and immature and just sort of reminding us about their young ages. Also sort of the in fact case that we forgot. And also the fact that Egwene doesn't get the full scoop of how much danger they might be in. Yeah. Like she is left out of the loop here. I think that was a really good point that you made. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I like when you say I make good points because <laughs> I have no idea if my points are good or not. So when the hills become even wider, Elias thinks that it'll take way too long to go around them, but they have to be very careful going over them. So he gets Perrin and Egwene to wait at the base and he sneaks up to the top and lays down so that only his eyes can see over the ridge, like to the point where he even takes his hat off yeah he's using like extreme caution yeah and i'm just kind of thinking like is this a it's better to err on the side of caution situation because again we get this repeatedly where he is being like super super cautious yeah i think that whatever this dream was really freaked him out that's my okay prediction on that I don't know if he actually can see or sense more. Yeah. It doesn't really seem like he can. Because even when, you know, these ravens do sort of bust out, the wolves are surprised by it. And Elias does mention later on that he wasn't specifically looking for ravens. Yeah. He just, th- it, it comes back to that gut feeling. Yeah. So. And that's what I think it comes down to, yeah. too. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, so he sneaks up to the top, he looks over, and then he motions for them to come join him when all is safe. Perrin thinks about how he will know if there's danger because the wolves can sense it. But he also has a moment where he thinks about how much he hates his connection with the wolves. Yeah, he really goes back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, he wishes they would vanish and how it would be wonderful if they just went away. But for now, he's all right with them warning him about danger. Yeah, it's like super situational that you're okay with it when you need them. But... Well, and it's again, just like Nynaeve. Yeah. Wishing that she could just do away with Moraine and all Aes Sedai. And Perrin thought that way about Aes Sedai as well. And he was happy for her help, but then wishes her to go away forever. Yeah. So maybe it's that two rivers mentality. I don't know, but I'm seeing a lot of similarities between Perrin and Nynaeve. Yeah, they definitely have some similarities in their personalities. Yeah. So the third time that Elias insists on doing this, Perrin goes with him because he just can't stand the waiting. And the one thing I want you to make a note of is that at this ridge... The third time when Perrin follows Elias, he has a feeling like he's going to throw up and it says sour fumes rise in his throat and his stomach lurches and it's like that gut reaction that's happening to Perrin right before we know now the ravens pop up. Right. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I just, I guess, equated that to him hating just the thought of standing there waiting and not knowing. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought it was interesting that the only time that we hear that Perrin has this stomach lurching thing is like right before something actually happens because they've had yeah multiple instances of going over these ridges so far. Okay. So yeah, so he goes up there with Elias and he thinks about how the wolves are a mile ahead and hadn't seen anything. So this is a waste of time. And he stands up to tell Elias this just as a shit ton of ravens bust out from a group of trees like yeah, just boom. ahead of them yeah they're here yeah and Perrin dives down hoping that he wasn't seen and as the birds are sort of flying above the trees suddenly they all fly together and switch directions to go south yeah so out of another group of trees Just off a little ways, more ravens bust out and all start heading south as well. And Perrin is just in shock and asks Elias if this is what he's been looking for. And Elias says, no, I told you, I don't know what I'm looking for. Yeah, so this is kind of the confirmation that Elias doesn't actually know what he, he just had that gut feeling. Yeah, but it turns out that the wolves don't look up much. Yeah. So not helpful, wolves. And I mean, that kind of makes sense. Like, wolves don't have any natural predators that are going to be coming from trees. Well, not now they do. Well, now they do, yeah. <laughs> Turns out. <laughs> and just for directional sense, the group of Elias, Perrin, and Egwene are heading south. And now the birds are also heading south, but they're like ahead of them. Yeah. Okay. So as Elias is saying that the wolves don't look up much, 
another group of ravens from the far west also take off southward. So Elias says that this isn't that big of a hunt and so that this is a good thing. Yeah. And he was worried that the ravens would know to be looking for Perrin after that dream. And yeah. I thought so too. I thought that whole raven pecking the eye thing is pretty important. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's some sort of connection here, but it doesn't look like they've been spotted. No. They're like looking in the general area. Yeah. But it doesn't really seem like the ravens know where they are yet. Yeah, not yeah. exactly, but possibly just like a general sense. Right, and Perrin is surprised that Elias doesn't think that hundreds of ravens is big. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting look into Elias as a character as well. Yeah, more information on Elias ton- here. Yeah, tons here. Because he says that there's sweeps of ravens in the borderlands that can range up to the thousands. Thousands, I know. Crazy amount yeah. of ravens. But then it, it sounds like he's speaking from first sound knowledge. Yeah. Like he's actually been there. Because how else would you know all this stuff unless you've been in the borderlands? Yes, that's true too. Crazy. Okay, yeah. so Elias reaches out to the wolves to tell them to backtrack and check the trail behind them now. Yeah. Because they're clearly being, like, pursued by ravens. And it's kind of the same situation as when they were being pursued by Trollocs, where the Trollocs were trying to surround them. Yes. Right? And now with the ravens, we've got ravens ahead of them and to the sides, and now Elias getting the wolves to check the back trail to see if they're literally going to be surrounded by ravens. Yeah. And so... These wolves are so far that Perrin can't really feel them anymore, but he hears Elias sort of say to them, hurry, watch the skies, hurry. Yeah. And then he does feel a faint reply from the wolves, and they say, we come. Yeah, So that's nice. (laughs) And then he gets an image that flashes in his mind of wolves running. Yes. So even cooler. So... Previously, we've had Perrin with the feelings and the impressions of wolves. Yeah, this power just keeps getting better. Yeah, it's like powering up how good he is with the wolves. Yeah. So, like, previously, it was just, like, image. It wasn't images. It was just, like, an impression, a feeling. He could sense that there were wolves. Yeah. And now it seems like it's full-blown, like, he can get a literal image, a view of what's happening. Yeah, it's really cool. I like it. It's a cool power and i love i love when the wolves say we come why it's great it's just cute oh yeah oh we coming we coming (laughs) here we come yeah like that exactly (laughs) except like cooler oh yeah okay Okay. (laughs) maybe no no he's thinking like um like if like little pupper dogs yeah like come here come here and they're like oh okay we coming now yeah like i don't know like cute little baby puppies i, I get what you're saying Not on the as, same page like we coming. like cool snap like we can we come yeah. <laughs> what do you we come we come <laughs> <laughs> we come now we come now so elias says that he knows a place they can go but he's not sure if they can reach it before dark and i think uh-oh Another place where evil things can't go. Like, yeah. is this really a good idea? It's like, are, do they not want to go there because it's worse? Yeah. <laughs> like another Shatter Logoth situation? Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. So I looked at the map. Yeah, and okay. And so there isn't really anywhere except for the Four Kings yeah. and the Archer Hawkwing statue. Yeah. And so, unless it's not on the map, which is possible because Eridol or Shadar Logoth wasn't on the map. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's hard to say. <laughs> yeah. And it's also hard to say exactly where they are on that map. That's true, They're too. like somewhere in the wilderness. Yeah. So, anyways, I'm just on edge thinking about this, quote, safe place. Yeah. That these evil won't go and it's safe for them, but... And again, I don't know if it's because I'm not like a super trusting reader, but I also had that feeling like is Elias just telling them that there's a safe place to give him hope. Yeah. Like I totally had that impression of he's saying, oh yeah, there's somewhere safe that we might be able to get to by nightfall just to give, just to make them move faster. To keep them going. Yeah, keep yeah. them going. I don't know. But Perrin questions Elias again. So he actually does have lots and lots of questions for him from even back at the Tinker Camp. 
He's like, we should get going. He's yeah. like, nope, something's telling me to stay. And then Perrin is insistent on what something. What is that something? What do you know that you're not telling me? And he's really on his case. Yeah. So here, he's really on his case, demanding answers and never getting any. So Perrin wants to know, why do we have to get there before dark? And I'm thinking, oh, like, maybe he's worried about another, like, Shatter Logoth situation. Yeah, yeah. Because they had to find shelter there before dark. Yeah, absolutely. So, I don't know. He's saying, why dark? And then Elisha says, well, ravens roost at night, and they won't pursue us then. So, that's why. And we have to keep moving, and they may not be able to move as fast as they like either. But for now, dark is a long way off, and they best keep moving. Yeah, so this is like an all-day journey. Yeah. But this brings up some really good points about the power of the Dark One. Because we have heard before multiple times that the Dark One uses like carrion eaters, rats, ravens, things that eat dead things as their eyes. And even when the boys, Rand and Matt, are in the village and that raven does that sidestep to dodge their slings, the rocks they hurl at them, ravens are used as the Dark One's eyes. Yeah. But when Elias says that ravens roost for the night, it seems like the ravens aren't completely under the control of the Dark One. Yeah, that's fair. Because you think that spies for the Dark One yeah. wouldn't be like allowed to just roost, roost for the night. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like they're still ravens. It's just the Dark One can see through the eyes of these birds. Okay. Just kind of an interesting point to make. Yeah, Absolutely. So they keep moving here and quickly too. Seems as though they are about to start their ultra marathon here. Yeah, a little bit. Like they are just going to run and run and run for miles and miles, for hours and hours, all day long. Yeah, literally from sun up to sunset. Yeah, that's how it feels. Yeah. And that's how Perrin and Egwene are feeling by the end too. Yeah. And Bella. And Bella. Don't forget Bella because this is the opposite of the Tinker Way. Oh, but you would make the... Horses work so hard. Yeah. Right? Poor Bella is being worked so hard, and I don't even think she gets it. She, well, maybe, yeah. Well, she probably gets it as much as Egwene (laughs) gets it. So, yeah, Egwene is very curious here about what's going on, and Perrin only tells her about the ravens that they saw. So they hit another crest, and while they're scouting, they watch a fox dart out of the trees, and a group of ravens swarm it and just, like, peck it to death and tear apart its flesh, and this is why I don't like birds. Yeah, this is an absolutely horrifying scene. Yeah, bad. Especially for the fact that if this happens to our group of adventurers here, you can't defend yourself against a hundred birds. Oh my god, you can't defend yourself against, like, one bird. I hate birds so much, and their pecky beaks and their beady eyes. Yeah. Well, like when that robin attacked you in the backyard? There were a bunch of robins. <laughs> that wasn't just, even if it was just one, but. Yeah. You like ran inside screaming with the baby <laughs> with one robin. <laughs> and then there were a whole bunch. And the robin wasn't even doing anything. It was just like tweeting. <laughs> they were dive bombing me. And squawking and squawking, and they and I ran to the front yard, and they were following me. It was a big thing. <laughs> it was the whole thing. <sighs> Birds, gosh. <laughs> Anyways, so just as the ravens sort of ascend and take off again, Elias yells at them to move, and so they start running. And Egwene gallops after them on Bella. And when they hit the small group of trees at the bottom of the hill, they turn and run along beside the trees. And Elias keeps yelling at them to run faster and faster. And Perrin almost trips and falls, thinking, like, I'm running as fast as I can. Yeah, this is just a hectic scene. Yeah, and as this happens, a lone raven flies up out of the trees, spots them, screams... And turns midair to fly south. Yeah. And, and then, this this seems like one of those Drakkar situations where if the ravens see these people, it's not an immediate thing. It's like it has to report. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. So Perrin frantically reaches for his sling and a stone. And then he watches the bird fold up and fall out of the sky. And turns out, Egwene is pretty good with a sling, too. Yeah, Egwene's kind of a badass. And so I say good for her, considering that she doesn't even understand the full, like, repercussions of having this raven see them. Yeah. And fly off. Like, 
She like gets it. Yeah. Yeah. Good so for her. Even her instincts to get it that quickly and understand that, oh, it's bad if ravens see us. Because she's just mostly probably concerned that the ravens are going to kill her. Yeah. Right? But this one was flying away. So curious that she was, you know, so instinctually able to get that raven really quickly. Yeah. It, it could have been like Perrin fumbling for a sling to clearly try to kill it. Could have been an indicator, and she's just a little bit quicker on the draw. Yeah, and so she's all proud of herself, at smirking at Perrin, and Elias calls to them and says, are you just going to sit there counting your toes? Yeah. <laughs> I like all those little quips. They're kind of yeah, funny. Yeah, we, we get a few good ones. So they actually head in to the trees here just as another flock of ravens, and I keep on saying flock of ravens, but didn't you say they were actually called a conspiracy of ravens? Yeah, or a... Because it's a murder of crows. Yeah, it was a conspiracy or a treachery or an unkindness. Oh. Yeah. I like treachery. A treachery of ravens. Yeah, I like that one too. Because it's less like they're sitting in their basements talking about how the earth is flat. (laughs) And more like they're plotting. They're plotting against you. Yeah. And these ravens are totally plotting. Yeah. So (laughs) the treachery of ravens to the far west heads like up out of the trees looking like a black mist and so Perrin feels the wolves passing in that direction and they notice the ravens on either side of them as if they're pursuing the wolves and then the ravens break off abruptly to fly south yeah so those are the wolves that had doubled back to check the back trail that elias had said earlier in the chapter to go and do right because north it's kind of backwards but the north direction is where they're coming from Right. So Egwene is really worried that they might have been seen by the ravens. And she thinks about how the ravens could do to them what they did to the fox. And Elias tells her that fear will kill you if you don't control it. And then he says, but they are gone and we should be too. Yeah. And that's good advice. I mean, they did get seen from that distance. So yeah. So Elias leads them out of the trees and then leads them westward. Basically, now they're just following the raven's path. And Elias sets like a really hard pace. Like we think it was hard before. No, he is running them hard. And Perrin notes that there is nothing left to do but follow him because he said there is a safe place. And I'm wondering sort of where that is now. Like this whole chapter, they've been alluding to this safe place. Yeah, like what that safe place actually is. Right. And what I'm thinking of, similar to how Eridol was supposed to be a quote safe place yeah i'm thinking of the archer hawkwing statue like that's what i wrote in my notes here as with question marks yeah because like why would a town be a safe place yeah it doesn't really make sense and it's kind of like old and quote ruiny yeah it's it's like an old (laughs) ruin type it definitely is yeah and so a lot of the time that we've been exposed to here things with powers that could contradict the dark ones probably are old yeah like a legend or whatever and so i think that's why my mind keeps going to this statue and you also pointed it out on the map um when we first saw it in like chapter 13 or something like that yeah so i'm thinking it's important yeah and maybe they're around it yeah i mean that that's a pretty good like logical rationale and for it, it turns so. out you know later on i'm right yeah which is always great but This was just sort of like a maybe situation in my notes while I was reading. It just like sort of kept coming to my head. I don't know if this happened for anyone else in their first read, if they were like looking for and wondering what it could be. Yeah. But um, like there has to be a reason why this is on the map. Yes. Yeah. That's true too. Okay. So this pattern sort of continues. They run to a hill, wait for the, oh, I wrote in my notes, crows. They're ravens, Oh, silly. no. Yeah. <laughs> How could you confuse the two? Oh, my goodness. I know. I wonder where else I yeah. did that. If I say crows, correct me. They're I will. Ravens. I will. Yeah. <laughs> you haven't said it yet. Okay. So they run to a hill. They wait for the ravens to move on and then run again and then wait again. And they're just like running so hard. Perrin is described as like panting and his chest heaving and he can... You know, his feet feel heavy and 
Bella is panting heavy with her sort of head down every time they wait. And even Egwene, who's riding Bella, is out of breath. And yeah. all of this seems really difficult. Well, just last page, it had mentioned that the sun was just at the midday peak. Yeah. So we're like halfway through the day heading into afternoon here. Right. So this is literally an all-day event. Yeah. And I, this just keeps continuing all day and they keep seeing like remnants of animals left behind by the ravens that have been pretty much massacred yeah and perrin remembers that lan told them how the dark one's creatures delight in killing yeah and so the dark one's power is death okay as perrin is thinking about how he doesn't want the ravens to peck them apart he gets a flash of images yeah so he can sense and see that the wolves have found more ravens north of them. And there are ravens sort of screaming and dive bombing and pecking and drawing blood with every swoop. And he feels the wolves jumping and fighting. And Perrin tastes feathers and the foul taste of ravens being crushed alive. So his power is definitely amping up. Whoa, because he could also feel the pain of oozing gashes all over his body. Yeah, so it's like shared experience with the wolves. Well, and then also, oh shit, the wolves are getting attacked. Yeah, but they do mention that wolves aren't as easily killed as foxes. Yes, and the ravens have a mission. So because these ones won't die and they can't peck apart and eat yeah. them, then they just take off. And yeah. The, the funny thing about a fox is that however big you think a fox is, it's actually smaller than that. Yes. I've heard that from a fox expert. A fox expert? Yeah. It was on a podcast. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was like, oh, you've run into a fox expert in your daily life? Not in real life, but on a podcast, they said, however big you think a fox is, it's smaller than that. Okay. And then I had to Google like size of foxes. And we all know yeah. that when people say things on podcasts... You can't lie. It's you, impossible. It's impossible. It's always the truth. Right. And it's, it's kind of like the internet. Exactly. Yeah. Totally the same. People don't lie on the internet. Yeah. And when people <laughs> claim to be experts on podcasts, you trust them. Exactly. Believe them. Yes. I'm an expert in... The Wheel of Time. Good. See? And foxes. There you go. And foxes now. Yeah. Turns out. <laughs> so here's a question for you. So now it's like we have Elias, Perrin, and Egwene, and Bella stuck in the middle of ravens on all sides. So they are essentially surrounded by ravens and they're moving in the center of this group of ravens. Just trying not to be seen. From any direction. Mm -hmm. So the gut feeling that... Elias had been having that prevented him from leaving the Tinker's camp before, it seems like if he had have left sooner or later than he did, then he would have been caught in the wrong situation with these ravens. So coincidentally, the feeling, the gut feeling he had to stay has led him to being in the middle in a good way. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Except that the ravens can fly faster than they can run. Yeah. So they're getting closed in on. But it's just that question of if he had have left sooner or later. See, I don't really know if it's his feeling or if it's complete coincidence that these ravens are only here now and we're going to be there anyway. Yeah. I really thought and still actually do think that these ravens are here searching for them because Baalzaman found Perrin. In the dream? In the dream. Okay. Then I think they woke up. And they were like, oh shit, something's happening. Because that's when Baalzaman or whoever, the Dark One, started sending ravens out to exactly where they are okay. to find them. And that's, I think, what maybe Rain sort of sensed in the air. Why things like changed. Was like maybe these ravens had all just sort of been sent this way yeah. or something that changed the air for him for whatever he sees in his way yeah okay so i don't know about gut feelings but i do know that he woke up heard about the wolves in pain and dying and fire and he was like okay something's we up go. we gotta go yeah we gets to go so he stayed with them as long as he could for however long they were safe. And maybe that was the gut feeling. I think so. Okay. I think that, and I think that these ravens would have found them and closed in on them. Because if they had been behind the ravens, that would have been positive. If, Possibly, yeah. And if they had been in front of the ravens, 
potentially they could have gone faster and hid more. I yeah. think the position that they're in really sucks, and I don't think this is good at all. So I'm going <laughs> to counter literally everything you just said. Okay. Because I don't agree. You, you, and you're allowed to not agree. Right, and I'm a raven expert. Yeah, it's, oh, shoot, so okay. Believe See, and I'm a fox I expert? Say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, back to this. Perrin can feel and sense and taste these things that the wolves are feeling, sensing, and tasting. Yeah. So interesting. So Perrin can see wind licking a wound on his foreleg. Yeah. And I also just make a little side note that there's something wrong with one of Hopper's eyes. I don't know why. Perrin got pecked in the eye. Oh. There's a Hopper Perrin connection somewhere in the future I'm already aware about. Because of the eye pecking? Cause, no, I don't know why. I'm just trying to... I know because of the internet that there's a Perrin Hopper connection. Okay. That's all. Like, that's all I, I just know that. I don't know why or how it comes about. And okay. so I'm looking for things. So you're looking for the eye connection. Right, that right was now what... anyway. Okay. And I know something happens with Perrin's eyes later on sure also no context okay so i'm really focused on hopper and eyes hopper and eyes and parent and parent and wolves and wolves yeah anyway so there's something wrong with hopper's eye and dapple gathers them all ignoring her own injuries like a real good pack leader yep and they set off and parent hears her say we come but danger comes before us Yes. Yes. So that's a nice little sort of tracking system to have. And Perrin exchanges a glance with Elias, who stares at him expressionless. Yeah, I love this part. And I think this is a funny interaction, because I didn't really get that Elias isn't 100% sure about Perrin hearing the wolves. What do you mean? Well, I, then I said, or maybe he just wants Perrin to admit it. Okay. But, because he sort of stares at Perrin almost in a questioning way. Like, what did you see? What did you hear? What did you feel? And I think he's trying to gauge if Perrin actually could do everything that these wolves sort of tell Perrin he could do. Okay. So, I think that's a really good point to make because you made me think a little bit more about Elias's interaction here. I don't think that Elias is questioning whether or not Perrin can talk to the wolves because i think that that's a mental connection that the wolves know okay. it's not a question okay but i think what a good point is is that elias is questioning how far perrin has developed his ability in the last couple of days yeah okay because if he's actually aware of the wolves feelings yet because we've seen a progression like Where an he exp- can sense the wolves. Yeah, like he gains a, a deeper connection with the wolves over the past couple of days and experiences. So yeah. maybe Elias is like waiting to see what Perrin actually can sense. Okay. Yeah, I like that too. But either way, Perrin realizes that Elias is sort of just waiting for him to admit it. Just making him fess like up. out yeah. loud. So reluctantly, Perrin says, Ravens behind us. And Egwene catches on to this interaction and she says, he was right. You can talk to them. So she is, and that's confirmation. She's been kept in the dark completely. Oh, completely. So the last she heard about Perrin talking to wolves was when they first met. Yeah. And that was just Elias saying, the wolves say that you can talk. become, you can talk to us. Right. Exactly. And that was like, that was it. Yeah. But Perrin is feeling all of the emotions right now. <laughs> Oh my goodness. But the main thing he feels here is shame. Yeah. And he again. He wishes he could outrun all of it, but especially Egwene's eyes. And your point that Perrin is a lot like Nynaeve really shows through here. Yes. Yeah. It's the shame in being able to do something that's not, in quotes, normal. Right. And now that she knows what he is... And then he thinks, what am I? Tainted? Cursed? Yeah. Right? Like, that's crazy. Yeah. And Egwene would be the most understanding out of everybody. You think so? Like, she can channel the power and wants to be an Aes Sedai. Yeah. So if anyone is going to be understanding out of this little group here, it's going to be Egwene. Oh, yeah. And so 
feeling her eyes on him, he immediately feels like she's upset about it or something. But I think, if anything, she's just upset that she, he, she didn't know sooner. Yeah. Or that Perrin couldn't confide in her. Or well, maybe she's excited for him. There's also that, and I know we already heard from Elias that this wolf ability has nothing to do with the power, but there's still that huge stigma about men being able to do things. Yes. So it's still that impression that men yeah, being able to do... Yeah, maybe that's why he thinks I'm tainted. It's that fear yeah. of the Dark One's touch in some way. Yeah, maybe. And I, I know we heard Elias say it's not that, but... Right, but I, I do think, out of everyone, Egwene would be the most understanding. I agree, yeah, I totally agree. But this is really all too much for him because he can barely keep his feet moving and he's holding on to Bella's stirrup and Egwene has to all but push him up into the saddle to give him a turn to ride. Yeah. So they're both so tired and after a while he gets down and makes her ride the horse again and... Elias will not slow down. Yeah. And it just kind of is drilling in that fact that they've been running all day. Yeah. So he urges them on and taunts them. And he reminds them of like the torn apart animals. And he actually makes Egwene vomit off the side of Bella while she's riding. And Perrin thinks about how they keep seeing ravens in the sky and how it'll only take one raven looking back. Yeah. And they they keep on taking down like strag stragglers, straggler ravens. Yeah, like the ones who are slings. like hanging behind. Yeah. And so the ravens are also coming fast from behind and Dapple and the other wolves have worked their way around them without stopping to lick their wounds. So Perrin seems to be open to talking to the wolves especially when his life is in danger yeah when it's convenient yeah and it's almost like he asks them how long how close yeah and the wolves have no notions of how time works for men and so Perrin is able to work out an image with them so that he can understand so it's yeah. kind of interesting pretty crafty yeah it's an image of where the sun would stand in the sky when the ravens are going to catch them and it's also interesting now that Perrin is actively doing something to in a sense communicate with the wolves oh yeah it's almost like he's so exhausted that he just needs to know how much longer he has to run for so he's yeah. like he's like oh, okay <laughs> just tell me yeah and so it's like anyone right yeah so Parent thinks about how it is about an hour from where they are now, and it's still at least two hours to sunset. So Perrin looks at Egwene, who is so tired in the saddle, and he wonders if he should tell her about their impending doom. Yeah, and that was kind of the point I brought up earlier with Elias. Is like is Elias talking about the place of safety as a means to keep them comfortable and pushing forward? Kind of the same way Perrin thinks about, should I tell her right. if we're going to be, you know, killed by these ravens or not? Right. Maybe. Yeah. I never got that sense. But... Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, Perrin is wondering about if he should tell Egwene about how the ravens will be on them and kill them like they did that fox. But I write a note here. I don't think the ravens would kill them. Oh, they really? They are okay. the spies. It won't be positive to be seen because they will relay their whereabouts to the dark one or whatever but like okay even that other raven who saw them was turning to fly away and it wasn't trying to attack by itself not attack them well and also consider the fact that so far every interaction the boys have had with trollocs they've never attempted to kill the boys They've... Yeah, but when they're all caught up in it, I don't think they're noticing that. No. I think it's all terrifying and dangerous, and I don't think they're noticing that they're not being immediately killed. I, I agree. I don't think the boys are aware that they're not trying to be killed right now, but I think that you're 100% right that the ravens wouldn't necessarily try to kill, but here's the point to that. They wouldn't try to kill Perrin. Right, okay. They maybe. might try to kill Elias and Egwene and report back and keep Perrin alive. Right, but the way I'm thinking about it is yeah. the Trollocs didn't kill Nynaeve when That's they true. clearly had a chance to. Yeah. 
it was like that's not who we're interested in that's not what our focus is and if parent i think parent might be like too tired yeah after all this running and just there, being there's completely so many like, depleted yeah. and when was the last time he even ate or drank any water or anything like he's not thinking clearly enough there's a lot of unknowns to this situation about what's going to happen if they get caught right and so he is for sure thinking that they are just going to die if the ravens catch up to them yeah so he thinks that an hour of hope is better for Egwene than an hour of despair and again with no communication yeah. So that's great. But Elias is watching Perrin, and clearly he can tell what Perrin is thinking. And Perrin looks at Egwene and blinks away tears. And then this is just the part I had to read a couple times because, like, he wants to kill her. Okay, so... Like, what? This is crazy. So this is, this is the thing. He is thinking, if the worst happens... Perrin has anxiety. But I mean, it's it's also in his defense, it's a fair point. If the worst happens and the Ravens catch up with them and they attack and we're going to be pecked to death, is he going to have the strength to give Egwene the mercy of a quick death as opposed to being torn apart by Ravens? I think it's just insane that this thought is even crossing his mind that if A and B and C happens, then he's going to kill his friend. Yes. Like, that's insane. Also consider that they've been running I know, from the beginning I know, of the day. I know, it's crazy. but <laughs> Very like, high stress situation. I would think maybe if they were in the middle of being attacked and Egwene is screaming because she's clearly about to die. But yeah. like, this is like a so, it's not a so far off possibility because they're being pursued by Raven. Yeah. But to be thinking this while they're still running, I don't know. I think it's a little nuts. So this is a classic Jon Snow, Mance Raider situation. Right, so like the kill, mercy kill. Yeah, so he yeah. shoots him in the heart so that Mance doesn't have to burn to death. Mm-hmm. But in that situation, he was already lit on fire and tied to a stake and was screaming because of the fire. But <laughs> Jon Snow probably would have had to think about, is this what I'm going to do prior to to yeah, Mance being on fire? That was a definitely, definitely situation. Like yeah, that yeah. was going to happen. And John had time to think about how that situation was going to play out. Yeah. But this is like completely hypothetical in Perrin's brain. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And he's going to kill his friend. So he's going a little bit crazy here. Anyway, so good news. Suddenly, there are no ravens ahead of them. And then a chill ripples through him and seems to carry away some of his fatigue. And Egwene also clearly feels this. And Egwene also clearly feels this, and so does Bella, because they are also pretty confused. Yeah. And Elias has a gleam behind his eyes and says that it's safety. Yeah, so he clearly knew that there was something to head towards for that moment of safety. Right. So I actually wanted to note here from the book. So Egwene says, it's strange, she whispered. I feel as if I lost something. Yeah. So I just find that interesting, reading okay. back on it, because clearly they're in one of these steadings. Yes. Right? Where there is no sense of the one power. Yeah. we. I gave a definition of a steading last time, and one of the most important points from that was that... I said I can't channel there. Yeah, I said I can't channel, and they can't even sense that the true source exists. So for her to say that I feel like I lost something is a huge indication that they cross that barrier. Yes. And last time you described it as, it's almost like, it sounds like a dome. Yeah. Yeah, and that's clearly what it is. It's like some sort of force field dome-like thing in an area. Yeah, and they're still just sort of in the open. So yeah. it's not like they ran into, you know, through some walls. Yeah, it's not or, a physical barrier. Or into a group of trees or something. It's yeah. just, they just, yeah. Yeah. It's not, a, it's not a physical barrier. Right. Elias actually starts laughing and tells them that they made it. And no raven will cross that line and no Aes Sedai either. The one power won't work here. It's safety. Yeah. And then that's when I said, oh, that's definitely a steading. Because you described that last time for me. Yeah. So Perrin looks around and this place looks normal. But it actually looks as if there's like bits of green grass 
starting to grow in here yeah. where there's no green grass anywhere. Did you have any theories on that? Yeah. Well, it's my dark one and evil things theory. Yeah. That's the theory. <laughs> <laughs> go go a little bit further with that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I so it's been a bad winter everywhere and we can't hear that enough. Yeah. Right? Everybody's so annoyed with the cold spring. And I said that it's clearly something's happening with the dark one, with these boys, with evil forces clearly affecting the climate around the world. Yes. And this okay. place that is not affected by the one power, by the dark one, by evil forces, by anything, seems to have a regular spring. Yeah. So it's almost like it's protected or it's sheltered from the Dark One's touch. Right, which is okay. also confirming that this cold weather and the bad spring has to do probably with the Dark One and the power in some way. Yeah, that's a pretty logical conclusion. Thank you. I'm all about the logic over here. <laughs> so when Elias is explaining to them that this place is safety... Perrin thinks about how something Elias said tickles his memory. And I don't know what that means, but I'm just noting it because it seems a little bit important. Okay. And Egwene is a little unsure, saying that she's not sure how she likes this place and she's not sure how it makes her feel. Yeah. Which makes sense to me. He says that I said I don't like this place. Because I can't feel the right. one power. Yeah. But... He also said that Aes Sedai won't cross the line and enter a setting. So Aes Sedai won't willingly because they can't touch the one power. Mm. And if you think about an Aes Sedai, and again, keep in mind, Egwene is not an Aes Sedai. Right. She's someone who is starting to learn how to channel the one right. power. Right, she can like just sort of sense it. Yeah, but it's like if you take a woman who is fully capable like Moraine, who her literal only line of defense in a lot of ways is this power she's not going to willingly put herself in a situation where she has none of that protection yeah that's fair and yeah. especially because she is not well liked in the world yeah right yeah, yeah it's like why would she willingly enter a setting okay that makes sense then i just didn't know if it was like a physical barrier and they couldn't cross N yeah or if it's just like they choose not to yeah for because, them they choose not because to. my next question is about how moraine is on her way to find perrin exactly and he's staying in this setting exactly so how badly does she want to connect with him <laughs> yes but also keep in mind that she's with someone who doesn't wield the one power right lan and nynaeve Nynaeve absolutely wields one. Oh, power. right 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 yeah <laughs> I, I was just thinking of people she's with yeah okay but yeah, land, right? Yeah, okay. So this is where Elias confirms that this is a steading and the Ogier yep. were here 3,000 years ago before the breaking of the world. And he also makes an interesting note that the steading makes the Ogier, I want to say Ogier, like that's my... I'm yeah, they're not, not, even, they're not French I'm ogres. not even that French. Yeah. I'm just... <laughs> that's what my brain goes when I see this word. Makes the Ogier, not the Ogier makes the steading. Yes. So if there happens to be a steading there, the Ogier like it and gravitate towards it? Is that what that sounds like to me? That's a great question. Okay. Yeah. So it's not like the Ogier are, are capable of creating this That's steading? what it sounds like from what Elias is saying is that the Ogier do not create the steading. It's that there are steading and the Ogier flock to them. Gotcha. Okay. Well, they did anyway. Yeah. They don't now. Not to this one. No. And that also makes sense why Rain wanted to go to a steading. Yeah. If he's like sensing like these ravens and like evil. Yeah. Right? He's like, I'm going to go stay at a steading for a while. Because nothing bad comes into them typically. Right. Side note, a steading does not prevent evil men from crossing. Right. Yeah. That He does say that we, here. We get that later, yeah. but for the most part, it prevents the Dark One's minions yeah, from entering. Exactly. Okay. So Elias tells them that they need to go in further because the ravens can still sort of see them by the edge. And Egwene and Perrin are now like just so fatigued. Now that they've stopped, they don't want to start again. Yeah. And Perrin has to keep forcing him stuff to take steps but elias doesn't really seem to be affected at all yeah i was gonna ask you if you had any thoughts on like yeah. elias seemed to be able to keep pace with this for a long so time. i don't know if this is just stamina because 
he's used to just running with wolves all the time. Yeah. Like, if you train for a marathon... You can do that. You can do that. You can run for, an, like, hours and hours at a time and be relatively okay compared to if I tried to run a marathon tomorrow, <laughs> yeah. right, to save my life, I'm going to be in a lot worse shape than somebody who's constantly training for marathons. Exactly. Right? So I don't know if this is just stamina or if it is actually something more. Okay. So hypothetically, if it was something more, what would that be? I'm not really sure. Okay. Because he does have a connection with wolves that's clearly magical. So something to do with way, like wolves being... Wolf power. Yeah, okay. I'm going to call him like Wolfman. Yeah, that Although works. Although I used to call Lan Wolfman Lan because he reminded people of a wolf. I think that's also in part because in like the first introduction of Lan, they said he had a dangerous look like a wolf. Yeah. It was some sort of description like that. And then I like that it rhymed. Yeah. But now this is more accurate. Anyway, I think that it's just like the a magical wolf connection okay. so whether that makes him be able to do more than communicate with wolves yeah because it clearly gave him yellow eyes like a wolf like it'll give him some extra strength and stamina and but physically yeah. his eyes are wolf eyes yeah right so there is something physically that has changed about him or that always was we're not sure but there's something there like maybe his stamina is a, that of a wolf because of this magical property so that's something to start looking for in Perrin. Right. Okay. We've seen an, uh, an escalation of Perrin's powers, so we can start looking for that in him too. Sure. Okay. So Perrin wants to just like stay here until it's all over. And then Elias asks, well, how long will that be? Like, plus, like there's nothing to eat here. And it also doesn't keep men out. Yes. So he says there is a place where there is water, but it's another mile or two. So they have to keep on. And that sounds terrible. But they finally get there and the water is great and it's all cold and refreshing. And they just sort of get to relax. Perrin puts his whole head in the cold water and then flings his hair around. And he gets Egwene and she splashes him back playfully. But then he instantly is like regretful. Of the fact that he would just kill her. So, yeah, no kidding. Yeah, so a lingering concept in Perrin's mind here is clear that, clearly that thought about what's going to happen if the worst comes to it. Yeah, and it's like, you know, that doesn't have to be your responsibility. That's true. Like, who's to say Egwene would even die, right? Like, even if she was pecked by, like, maybe she could get away and escape. Like, yeah. And you just cut her down. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really speaking, I think, to his mental exhaustion. Maybe. I'm hoping that's it. Because otherwise, like, there's something else fucked up going on. <laughs> <laughs> like, that he's having these dark thoughts anyway. Yeah. But, so, now he sees her having fun, and he's just in his own head about it, feeling upset that he even thought it in the first place. It's, again, that guilt and shame. Yeah, I think so. But Egwene is just in this great mood and can't understand, like, Perrin's emotional detachment yeah. and she's just laughing and joking but he can feel her eyes on him and she starts to show signs of worry because he like can't even look at her and then they eat their meal of like bread and cheese in silence and a somber mood descends now Perrin is brooding yeah <laughs> and well, I'm like again... oh no did he steal a dagger too <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think we have to worry about that. But again, it's kind of like Egwene's left on the outside of what's actually happening in Perrin's mind. Yes. Oh, for sure. Because he's not going to be like, it's fine. I'm just feeling bad because I was going to kill you. Yeah, no like, big deal. what the fuck? But no. hey, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> because it didn't come to that. But Elias builds a fire and Perrin has pretty much just drawn in on himself. And... On the spot where Elias built the fire, Egwene is looking at the rocks and says that part of it looks like an eye. And Elias is pretty matter-of-fact about this and says, it is. It is an eye. It's yeah. Archer Hawkwing statue. And I said, nice. I was kind of right. But this place actually does seem safe for now. Yeah. So that's good. <laughs> so it, it really is an interesting backstory that we get here because Elias kind of bust into a little bit of world building information for us as the reader but Egwene sort of yells out why would someone carve an eye here in this rock in the middle of nowhere yeah and elias mutters something about what do they teach you village whelps 
And this is back to my public school issue. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> but he heads into this story about Archer Hawkwing. And I'm going to look to you to take over on this one. Yeah. So it is kind of funny that Elias is looking at Egwene like she's kind of dumb for asking this question yeah. about just an eye. It's like, no, there's a whole statue here that's carved. This boulder is just the eye. Yeah. Because the previous couple of paragraphs had alluded to the fact that there's a bunch of like misshapen boulders. Yeah, rocks everywhere. So yeah, rocks everywhere. Yeah. And it's like clearly that's the remnants of the statue and there's also an eye that they're close to. Yeah. But yeah, so we get a lot of world building information here. And we've gotten a couple things and tidbits of information about Archer Hawkwing previously from the descriptions and in the glossary. But this is where Elias really gives us a full-blown detailed explanation of what happens. And this is going to be really important for circling back on a couple of major points we learned earlier in this book. Okay. So we have Archer Hawkwing, whose full name was Archer Pendrag Tanrael, who was the High King. And he united all the lands from the Great Blight to the Sea of Storms, from the Arth Ocean to the Aeol Waste. So Archer Hawkwing is kind of like the... Alexander the Great of this book series. Yeah, like the Great Conqueror. Yeah, so he yeah. conquered the entire land. He united the entire world or the entire known world except for the Aeol Waste. And some stories say he ruled the whole world even beyond the Waste and he sent armies across the Arth Ocean. So he was seen as this conqueror who brought peace and justice to the land. Right, and we have talked about this before. Yes. Specifically in that bonus episode where yes. we talked about sort of the history. Yeah, the and... ma the major events of the world. Yeah, so Egwene adds a couple of things to this story and that makes it seem like this is one of those legends that is told to kids, you know, growing story up. Storytime or like Gleeman tales type of thing, right? Yeah, because she kind of quotes that, you know, everybody stood equal before the law no man raised his hand against another. So Archer Hawkwing kind of brought about this period of peace in the world by uniting the land. Ah, so you have heard the stories at least, Elias chuckled. Yeah, and Elias mentions that like Archer Hawkwing brought peace, but he brought it with fire and sword because the one way to make peace yeah. is to conquer everything. Yeah, and right? be the strongest of everyone and no one can fight you. Yeah, have yeah. the biggest stick. Yeah, and then Elias goes on to say that, you know, a child could ride with a bag of gold from the Arth Ocean in the spine of the world without fear. So Archer Hawkwing was a king who, to the common folk, the common people, really loved him because he was fair and just and all the common people had, you know, full bellies. But anyone who ever challenged his power was going to pay the price. So he didn't actually let anyone challenge his power or even think about it. Right, but he also hated Aes Sedai, right? Yes, and that's the big thing is that he laid a 20-year siege to Tar Valen and put a thousand gold crown bounty on the head of any Aes Sedai. So Elias kind of has this back and forth where we know that he has this negative connotation with Aes Sedai because the Red Aja tried to gentle him, which didn't turn out very well. Yes. But then on this side, he's saying Hawkwing was a proud fool and that when he was sick... And he got sick, and some say he was poisoned, that only an Aes Sedai healer could actually save him. But since he had been laying this 20-year siege to Tar Valen, he wouldn't let any Aes Sedai near him to save his life. Yeah. So it's like you're so prideful that you died because of it. Yeah, it says he hated the Aes Sedai as much as he hated the Dark One. Yeah, so, so that's pretty bad. Yeah. And that is uh, something that we've heard quoted or very similar to the traditions of the White Cloaks. Yeah. Where yeah. they think that the Aes Sedai are literally like shadow spawn. Yeah. Basically now, anyone wielding the one power has to be bad. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No questions asked. Yep. So the next little tidbit that we get here is that Elias mentions that Hawkwing had every Aes Sedai penned up behind the shining walls of Tar Valen. And that's a really important sentence because this is the next reference to the Shining Walls that we've heard. The first time we heard that Shining Walls reference was in Tam's fever ramblings. Right. When Ran was bringing yeah, him yeah. into the town where Tam said the savages came over the Dragon Wall like a flood. They burned cities, destroyed the topless towers of Kyrian, all the way to the Shining Walls. 
And at that point, we didn't know that the Shining Walls was Tar Valen. We've already sort of talked about how we can assume they are, though. Yeah, absolutely. But that's yeah. just like confirmation oh, that okay. that is, yeah, in yeah. fact, where Tam found Rand. Okay. Was at the Shining Walls cool. on Dragon Mount. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Now... More Rand tangents in the parent chapter. Yeah. Love I, it. I always look for the Rand tangents. <laughs> now, a couple big things about where they physically are right now and why this Archer Hawkwing statue is important. And on the map is because this statue was built inside the steading because at the height of Hawkwing's power, he was going to build his capital, his new city, in a place where there was a steading so that Aes Sedai could never really come there. Right. Because of that hatred for Aes Sedai. So that that steading was going to be the, the center of his entire nation. Okay. Yeah. Now... It's also in like the center of the country too, right? It, it is kind of like right in the middle. But it so happened that Hawkwing died the same day the statue was finished. And then when Hawkwing died, we learned from the glossary and when we talked about this stuff in the bonus episode that his entire bloodline pretty much fought for control of his empire because Hawkwing had brought every nation together under one ruler, but when he died, that pretty much broke out the War of the Hundred Years, which Elias mentions happened over 123 years, but every nation like carved out its own peace in this war and his entire bloodline died with him except for the people who possibly went over the earth ocean because it is said that he sent some people that way right but we have no no knowledge of them okay yeah now the one big connecting point that we, i want to bring up here about this story that elias talks about and what we've seen previously is that in chapter 14 at the stegen lion when rand has that dream with Baalzaman. Baalzaman goes on a big rant to Rand about the fact that he has never been bound in Shale Ghoul. Right. If you remember that conversation, he... Not really, no. Okay, so just... Not even a little bit. (laughs) I was reading this and I was thinking, hmm, I wonder how this connects to Rand's dream at the Stegen Line in Chapter 14. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, so when you go back and reread that (laughs) dream sequence chapter... Oh my goodness, okay. So Baalzaman goes on a big rant to Rand about a couple of things. He says that he was the one who stood at Luz Theron Telemon's shoulder when he did the deed that named him the Kinslayer. He says he was the one who sent Trolloc south to start the Trolloc Wars, which pretty much like ravaged the world for 300 years. And the most important part is that Balzaman says, I was the one who whispered in Archer Hawkwing's ear. And the length and breadth of the land, I said I died. So oh. it sounds like Baalzaman was the one who made Archer Hawkwing hate Aes Sedai, lay siege to Tar Valen for 20 years, yeah. and prevented Archer Hawkwing from, like, not dying. Because he also says, I whispered again, and Hawkwing sent armies across the ocean, sealing two dooms. One was his doom, one doom was his dream of one land united and one people, and then another doom yet to come. And then Baalzaman also says that at his deathbed, I was there when his counselors told him only I said I could save his life. I spoke and he ordered his counselors to the stake. Oh. Yeah. And I spoke and the High King's last words were to cry that Tarvalin must be destroyed. So while Baalzaman was bragging to Ren in this dream that I was the one, I've never been bound in Shell Ghoul. Cool. okay. I yeah, created yeah. all these catastrophes. He Very was the one. Yeah, he was the one who essentially caused Archer Hawkwing's entire empire to collapse and die and hate Aes Sedai. Interesting. So that kind cool. of, yeah, that puts a lot more proof in the fact that, you know, Balzaman was in fact never bound in Shale Ghoul. Right. Yeah. Okay. It, I, I don't even really know what all that means, but it's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> You're shaking your head at me. Yeah. Like, it's all connecting, and I get it, but it still makes very little sense. Okay. Like, it's, That's it's fair. starting to come together, but, like, the, cool. the biggest. I'm like, oh, man, that Baalzaman guy, he's so old. So like, the, <laughs> the most important part to take out of this is that it doesn't seem like the Forsaken or Balzaman specifically, has been bound in Shale Ghoul at the moment of creation by the creator. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, so that's a bad thing. Yeah, th- okay, that's yeah, not good. And now he's looking for these guys. <laughs> oh, man! <laughs> I'm sorry I don't have the reactions you want me that's to okay. have. 
Maybe one day. Soon. One day soon, I will have the reactions you want me to have <laughs> when I understand. I think that you just cannot comprehend what it could be like for me not knowing everything. So the biggest thing you should probably take out of this is that Elias sure seems to know a lot about history. Yeah. And is like annoyed that these country bumpkins don't. Because they don't have public education. Yeah. And he's like, oh man, you guys know nothing, idiots. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, so Perrin actually thinks about how this eye reminds him of the hard black raven's eyes. Staring at him without pity. And we sort of get the chapter title. Kind of, sort of, yeah. And then he wishes that they were sleeping somewhere else tonight. And that kind of makes sense. Yeah. And that's the end of this chapter. Yeah, and that's the end of this episode. Yeah, I think so. But I'm also sort of left wondering about uh, Perrin and how he's getting better at communicating with these wolves. But he's like still wishing that he couldn't. Yeah, he's very back and forth on that. Yeah, and so I'm sort of just wondering that, like, even after all of this, what will it take for him to embrace it and accept it? And, like, come full board? Yeah, and be, like, okay with this and not just, like, completely hate himself. Yeah, that's a good question. So that's what I'm left wondering about this chapter. Yeah, and then also more about Elias's backstory. Yeah, Elias seems like a really cool character. Yeah, he's he's definitely interesting. I'm I'm excited to see what happens if and when they meet with Maureen and Lana Nynaeve. Right, because that should happen. It's 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 set up like it's going to. It's very much so set up like it's going to happen. Right. Um, I could see Maureen finding them. Yeah. And then like seeing that he's alive. And seeing that he's in a setting and seeing that he's with a crazy wolf man <laughs> and then just like watching them from a distance yeah, and so not actually interacting with them. It's like, where is it going to happen and when? It's not so much a question of if it's going to happen. And then when Moraine and Lana and Nynaeve are spying on them, the wolves will actually be spying on Moraine. It's like a spy spire situation. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. A spies within a spies. Yeah. Yeah. Spyception. Ooh, spyception. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Okay. We're gonna end that for now and say that this is officially part of the pattern. It's part of the pattern. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Wheel Weaves. If you're interested in bonus content, cool stickers, shoutouts, access to exclusive insider looks, and to support us making great content, you can head over to patreon.com slash the wheel weaves podcast. You can find us on social media where we love interacting with our listeners. We're on Twitter at the wheel weaves podcast and on Instagram at the wheel weaves podcast. You can also join the conversation on our discord channel. There is a channel for no spoilers that I have access to and we also have a spoilers channel that Brett controls so fun for everybody there will be a link on Twitter and also over on our Patreon page you can check that out please feel free to rate comment and subscribe this really does make a huge difference plus if you want to tell a friend about us maybe someone who is just getting into the book series for the first time or other longtime fans who you think would enjoy us word of mouth is the best way for us to reach new listeners and we would take it as a really huge compliment. Thanks, as always, to audionautics.com for the music. And thanks to you awesome listeners.